This is the final video in our Proverbs series. We have had many videos over the last few months. And I wasn't planning on uh, going through Proverbs chapter 30 when I started this series, but as I read through it and saw how difficult it was to understand and try to understand what Agur, the writer of this chapter, was talking about, it just intrigued me. And so I decided to do a little research and ended up turning it into um, a teaching that I think you'll find interesting and, by the way, great wisdom from this chapter for our lives. So let's jump right in. It says in 30 uh, verse 1, the sayings of Agur, the son of Jacob, contained this message. Now we don't know exactly who Agur was. Um, the Hebrew is unclear on this word Jacob, so the scholars aren't really sure who he was. He obviously was a wise man, a sage during that day at least a possibility because of the name associated with him, Jacob, that he might have been Ishmaelite, don't know that, and at the end of the day it doesn't matter. But we just know that he was well known enough and his wisdom was good enough that it was included in Scripture, so we need to figure out what that wisdom means, and that's what we're going to do today. Now he used uh, a, something called a numerical verse which is basically a teaching style that was pretty common back in uh, ancient uh, Near Eastern literature. We saw it last video when we were talking about the six things that God hates, know the seven He detests, and how the last line of the list uh, is basically the culmination or the, the focal point of the list. Well, He does this five times in this chapter. In fact, that's His teaching style and it makes it very hard to understand unless you understand what he's trying to do with it. So that's what I'm going to help you do today, is we're going to look at this numerical verse teaching style. And you don't have to understand it now. As we go through it, you'll catch on real quick on how the teaching style works. But before he does that, he begins by contrasting the wisdom of man, humanity, versus the wisdom of God. Listen to what he says. Verse 2, I am weary, O God. I am weary and worn out, O God. I am too stupid to be human, and I lack common sense. I have not mastered human wisdom, nor do I know the Holy One. Now here's the key. Nor do I know the Holy One. What he's saying about human wisdom and the fallacy with human wisdom is, if you don't know God, you don't know wisdom. Now, go all the way back to the beginning of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All wisdom, all true wisdom, comes out of a relationship with God. God is the author of true wisdom. So he's saying here is, if you don't have a relationship with the Holy God, you're not ever going to have wisdom. You're going to have worldly wisdom, and your worldly wisdom is going to be, uh, it's going to lack common sense, verse 2, and it's going to be so stupid because it's not based in truth that you're going to look like you're too stupid to be human. And so he says, here it is. Here's human wisdom without God. I'm too stupid to be human. There's no common sense in it. Let me give you an example. Not long ago, a doctor appeared before uh, a Senate committee to explain to these senators how there's no such thing as just two genders anymore. And he talked about gender fluidity, and he tried to throw some science behind it. It was absolutely ridiculous. It was the goofiest thing you've ever heard. But he's trying to talk about how now a man can have a baby, you know, if it was a she and she was a transi uh, transgender, and there's not just two genders anymore, and there, there can be multiplicity of genders. I, I mean, just a bunch of bull. And what was so amazing about it all is he really, he really acted like he believed this stuff. And all I could think about when I watched that thing was, I am too stupid to be human. I'm listening to this guy going, he's too stupid to be a human. Humans can't think that. That's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. But secular humanism, with all of their intellectualism, without God, began to talk about some of this stuff. And, and, and you can look back in some of the evolution stuff. You can look back in some of, the, of, of uh, biology. You can look into physics. You can look into astronomy. You can look into all of this stuff. Uh, DNA. And some of the ridiculous things that they claim without the wisdom of God is just asinine. I mean, just stupid. They're too stupid to be human. Now, is some of the stuff true? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not in any way negating any of the true science behind it. I'm just saying a lot of their stuff is theory and not true science, and it's ridiculous because it's not based in God. That's all I'm saying. By the way, God is the author of all science, and all true science is from God. 
And so you have to understand that. You just have to be able to determine what's true science and what's the bunk myths that they're coming up with in today's secular culture. So then he comp contrasts that with God's wisdom. Who but God goes up to heaven and comes back down? Who holds the wind in his fist? Who wraps up the oceans in his cloak? Who has created the whole wide world? What is his name and his son's name? Boy, there's a reference to Jesus right there. Do you see that? Tell me if you know. So what he's saying is, as opposed to human's wisdom where we have no common sense and we're stupid, then there's the perfect God who created everything and is the author of all truth and all wisdom. And he says that's where wisdom comes from. And then listen to what he says next. Every word of God proves true. Every word of God proves true. He is a shield to all those who come to him for protection. Do not add to his words that he may rebuke you and expose you as a liar. So he says there's really kind of two choices here. You can accept God as the author of wisdom, and what you're going to find out over time, every word that he says will prove to be true. And by the way, in this secular humanistic culture where God's truth is not recognized as truth and it's made fun of as old-fashioned and fairy tales and myths, I want to tell you something. The day's going to come. It will be proven true. And all of this ridiculous talk that's going on right now where God is left out of the picture and they think they're so wise and smart, it will be shown, it will be exposed as lies by the, by the Holy One. You wait and see. So here's what he's saying. What camp do you want to be in? What camp do you want to be in? Because the Lord's going to come at some point and he's going to prove his words to be true and their words to be lies. If you will stand with God now and in some ways be persecuted for your beliefs, what you'll get is the protection of the Lord when his word is proved true. But if you decide to compromise your truth now for all of this garbage that you're hearing in, in culture that's ridiculous, then when he comes back to prove it true, him true, he's going to prove those to be liars. And guess what you're going to be? You're going to be proven as a liar as well. So that's what he's saying. And it's really, this is really, really applicable to what's going on in our culture right now. So then from there, he says, before I get into this wisdom that I'm going to share with other people, I'm going to ask two things of you, Lord. Number one, verse seven, I beg two favors from you. Number one, let me, oh, I'm sorry, let me have them before I die. First, help me to never tell a lie. Boy, we've talked about lying a lot in the book of Proverbs. In this context, I think what he's saying is, Lord, give me the strength to stand up for your truth and your wisdom and stay under your protection and not fall into cultural lies so that I won't be exposed as a liar later on. So help me not to tell a lie. Help me stay with you in the truth for your wisdom. And then second, listen to this. You probably didn't know this was in the Bible, by the way. Second, give me neither poverty nor riches. Give me just enough to satisfy my needs. For if I grow rich, I may deny you and say, who is the Lord? And if I'm too poor, I may steal and thus insult God's holy name. So his second request has to do with money. And, and you have to understand, throughout history, and certainly during this time period, the kind of the ongoing popular understanding of God is that if you had financial blessing, it was financial blessing from God, and that must mean you are holy or you are righteous. And so the wealthier you were, the more righteous you were seen to be. Well, here he is with some wisdom that flies in the face of that because truth is, the Bible doesn't say that anywhere. That's just what people believe from the Bible. <clears throat> so what he says is, Lord, I don't want to be so poor that I end up sinning, stealing stuff, and dishonoring your name. But let me tell you something. I don't want to be so rich. I don't want to be so rich that I forget you. And that's the problem with money. By the way, there's nothing wrong with money. There's nothing wrong with being wealthy. I know some very faithful, godly, wealthy people. But wealth can be a deterrent to trusting in God because it's so easy to trust in wealth when you have it that you don't have to trust in God. And he says, listen, I don't want to get to the point I have so much money I don't trust you anymore. So don't give me that much money. I think that's a great prayer, by the way. I think that's a wonderful prayer for your life. Sometimes we just pray, God, give me more. God, give me more. God, give me more. Thinking that, that will be his blessing to me. You know what God wants for you more than anything else in your life? For you to be close to him. And he knows your heart better than you know your heart yourself. It could be that when we're asking God, give me more, give me more, God is saying, I can't say yes to that prayer 
although I love you and care about you because I know that you can't handle money. You can't handle wealth. If you got all that wealth, you would walk away from me. You would forget me. You wouldn't trust in me. So I'm gonna say no to the wealth to keep you close to me. And so here's what I think is a more appropriate prayer than Lord, give me more wealth. How about this? Lord, give me the wealth you want me to have, but don't give me so much, I forget you. Don't give me so much, I don't trust in you. And so that is his request from the Lord before he now gets into these five teachings that he wants to share with us. But that one I think is a huge application for us with regard to our relationship with our money today. Okay, let's uh, jump into these and we'll take each one of them uh, one at a time. The first one comes out of 15 and 16. It says there are three things that never satisfied, four that never say enough. Okay, so what are we gonna talk about here? The theme is going to be satisfaction, finding satisfaction, having enough. So he's gonna use four, and the fourth one is the summary or uh, the conclusion of the first three, and let's see how this works. One thing that is never satisfied, the grave. Well, why isn't the grave satisfied? Because it never gets enough of dead bodies. The grave never says, you know what, I've had enough, no more death. It's never satisfied. The barren womb, boy, back in those days, uh, women's entire identity was in childbearing. And if they couldn't have a child, it was devastating to their identity as a woman. And a woman who could not give birth to a child, she, could, she never stopped the longing for a child. It just never went away. She just mourned and grieved and longed to have a child in her womb and give birth to a child. And so he's saying a barren womb, a, a womb that cannot give birth to a child for a woman, she's never satisfied, never satisfied. She wants to have that child. Number three, a thirsty desert. Well, I live in a desert, I live in Phoenix, and I understand this one pretty well. A thirsty desert just longs for rain and it will never be satisfied until it finally gets some rain. It needs that rain never satisfied. And then four, a fire, a blazing fire. No, a blazing fire still is never satisfied, but there's something a little bit different from a blazing fire, and that is this. It consumes everything in its path. It destroys everything around it. It is never satisfied until what? Until the oxygen is taken away and it burns out, right? So it absolutely destroys everything around it. So what is what is the, the lesson that we're supposed to learn out of this? And here's what I think it is. We are created by God to have a relationship with Him. He is the only one that gives us that which will satisfy us where we can say enough. And we will never be satisfied or have enough until we're back in relationship with God. Money's not gonna satisfy. Children aren't gonna satisfy. Marriage isn't going to satisfy. Relationships aren't going to satisfy. Alcohol is not going to satisfy. Material possessions isn't going to satisfy. Sexual fulfillment isn't going to satisfy. All of those things are fine and good in the proper context, but they're never going to satisfy the, deeping long, the deeper longing in our souls. Just not going to. We can have all those things and still long. We're still not satisfied. There's still not enough. We're not going to have enough and be satisfied until we're plugged back into God. So he starts this list of things. Here's the wisdom from me to you. Here it is, number one, don't buy into the line that anything else can satisfy you but God because it can't and it won't. Just accept that wisdom. The only way you're gonna find satisfaction is back in God. So that's number one. Number two um, is found in verses 18 and 19. There are three things that amaze me, four things I don't understand. So the first three are just amazing. They're just, wow, amazing to look at. And this fourth one, I simply don't understand. Amazing how an eagle glides through the sky. It's amazing how a snake slithers on a rock. It's amazing how a ship navigates the ocean. And then here's the one that I simply don't understand, how a man loves a woman. Now, this is the hardest one to understand, and as I went and read and did research to try to figure out, okay, what does the eagle and the snake and the ship all have in common um, that, that really sets them apart? Um, 
I, there's a couple of things I came up with. One is back 2,700 years ago, 2,800 years ago, 2,900 years ago, however long ago this was, um, those were things that they simply could not understand and comprehend. They couldn't comprehend them. They couldn't comprehend the ways of a ship on the ocean. They couldn't comprehend the science behind an eagle flying in the sky. But here's what all three of them do have in common. None of them leave any evidence they were there. You know, an eagle doesn't leave a jet stream. Uh, you don't understand the ways of the eagle. It's just there and gone in their mind. A snake, if it's slithering through uh, the desert, well, you can see exactly where the snake's been. But when he's on the rock, you, you don't know he's there. You don't, you, you don't comprehend where he is, and you can't tell where he's been. And it's the same way with a ship. As soon as the ship glides by, the ocean covers it back over. There's, there's leaving no trace there. And he said, those three uh, are amazing, but they're not as amazing as how baffled I am about the love of a man for a woman. And he says, I just don't get it. I don't get how a man acts around a woman. I, I, don't, I don't get why he's willing to do the things he's willing to do uh, for the love of a woman. And if, you've, if you remember when you were 20 and fell in love or 25 and fell in love or if you're, you're watching teenagers that fall in love, man, guys get goofy when they fall in love with a woman. When they're infatuated, they make the worst decisions. It's like all reason goes out the window and you just shake your head and go, what in the world did you do and why did you do that? because all reasoning goes out the window when he falls in love with a woman. Now it's interesting that the very next verse says, an adulterous woman consumes a man, then wipes her mouth and says, what's wrong with that? So it could be that he's talking about not just love, but adulterous love. And my personal opinion is that's exactly what he's talking about. He's talking about adulterous love. Here's what I don't understand. I don't understand a ship on the ocean, and I don't understand an eagle in the sky, and I don't understand a snake on a rock, but those are nothing compared to what I don't understand a guy that falls for the lines of the adulterous woman. I, I don't understand how he gets there. I don't understand how, how he throws everything away, how he gives everything up, how he'll destroy everything in his own path. He, he'll sabotage his own life. He'll lose his job. He'll lose his career. He'll lose everything just for a night with that woman. I don't understand that. That doesn't make any sense to me. And what he's trying to say is to wisdom, to men, guys, don't fall for that trap. Don't fall for that trap. It's a trap. Don't fall for it. So that's number two. The third one is out of 21 through 23. He says, there are three things that make the earth tremble. Four, that it cannot endure. So this is like an earthquake. I mean, he says, this one's so big. This one's so big that it like turns the world upside down. It just, it just, it's like an earthquake in the earth. And he says, one, a slave who becomes a king. He said, that's just, I mean, that's just unheard of. And, and you think about that culture. We live in a culture where you can kind of work your way up and a slave can become a king. But not back then. If you were a slave, you were a slave for life. And so he's like, the, the, the earth would be turned upside down if a slave could actually become a king. The second one, an overbearing fool who prospers. Once again, we see some fools who prosper, but back then you didn't because uh, you, you couldn't, there was no capitalism. You were stuck where you were stuck for the rest of your life. And, and fools, um, they, they ended up in poverty and they ended up in poverty every, every time. And he was like, it, it would be absolutely ludicrous to think that a fool uh, could end up prospering. A bitter woman who finally gets a husband. He says, boy, you want to talk about something that's unbelievable. That just a bitter woman who's just bitter and mean and she ends up attracting a guy and a guy marries her? What in the world is going on with that? How in the world could that happen? But then he says, as earth shattering as those are and as impossible as those three seem, and they were pretty impossible in that culture, as impossible as those seem, let me really give you the one that's impossible. The servant girl who supplants her mistress. That's the one that just shakes the world and turns it upside down. The first three really were very difficult to happen. This fourth one happened all the time. There's this girl. And she's the servant girl in the household. And her mistress, she helps her get dressed every morning. And helps her 
provide meals and helps her raise the kids. And then you know what happens when she gets the first chance? She seduces the husband and supplants the mistress. How earth-shattering and terrible that is. That turns the world upside down. Think about what it does to the woman. Think about what it does to the kids. And on the other hand, with a guy, it's the same thing. How could a guy marry a woman? And she support him all those years and have his babies and raise his kids and send him through school while he gets a degree and stand behind him in all of his failures. And then finally when he's successful and she's a little bit older and she's a little heavier and her body doesn't look like a 25 year old anymore, how could he just get rid of her for a 25 year old? How could that be? So this one is actually tied to the one before. It's talking about, it's talking about affairs and sexuality and he's just like, I, I can't imagine anything that tears the world up more than that. Can you imagine a woman staying with a man all those years and he just dumps her for a younger model or a woman who knows that he's married and supplants herself in the household to get rid of the woman? Oh my, that is evil. Oh my, that is terrible. Oh, that turns the world upside down. He said, I can't even imagine that. Here's his wisdom. Don't fall for that. Don't fall for that. That one is one that will really, really, really take you out. Don't fall for that one. Stay with the wife of your youth. Love her to the end. That's God's way. Don't be supplanted. Don't let, don't let your wife be supplanted by a younger woman. Younger woman, don't supplant a beautiful wife that has been with her husband all those years. Wisdom from the Proverbs. Number four, 24 through 28. Interesting about these is uh, there's not a three and a four. So this is just a list. So they're all the same. There are four things, verse 24, on the earth that are small but unusually wise. Okay, so we're going to talk about things that are small but wise. Ants, they aren't strong but they store up food all summer. Right? So they're very wise. They're smart enough to do what? Store up food so they have food all winter. Very smart. Hyraxes, another word for hyrax is a rock badger. They aren't powerful, but they make their homes among the rocks. Now, a, a rock badger is a little bitty varmint, and, and they're so, they're so uh, wise that they figured out a way to kind of build their homes in the midst of crags and rocks on cliffs. And so it's quite amazing that they can live their life that way, but they're able to. Uh, locusts, they have no king, but they march in formation. The interesting thing about locusts, I mean, they're small, but boy, they can work together in teamwork and do what? They can just absolutely wipe out a field in no time, right? And then fourth, lizards, they're easy to catch, but they're so sneaky, they're found even in king's palaces. And if you have any lizards in your environment, uh, as we do, Man, it's amazing how often those little suckers can slide in the door when you're not paying attention and end up living indoors for a little while. All four of these animals are really small, but they're all four wise in their own way in, in able to live and to even succeed in their environment in, fact, in spite of the fact that they're so small. They hide well. They work in formation. They work as teams. Uh, they prepare for later. They prepare for the winter. These, these things are all very wise, although they're small. So what's the wisdom? The wisdom is this. If you have a choice in life between choosing strength and power or wisdom, choose wisdom. Wisdom wins over strength every time. Wisdom wins over power every time. Don't think you can power your way to where you want to go. Don't think strength is your biggest um, ally. Your biggest ally is your wisdom. When I was young, I had one tool in my toolbox. It was a hammer. <laughs> and no matter what came up, I had one tool and I was going to use it. And sometimes it hurt people, and sometimes um, it damaged relationships, and sometimes it ended relationships because I only had one tool. Well, as I got wiser, as I got older, I realized I have a whole lot of tools in my toolbox. And the key to life is to learning which tool it takes for which project. 
And so with certain people, it's compassion. With certain people, you want to push them. On certain people, you encourage them. On certain people, you give them correction. You have to know where the person is at the time to be able to use the tools God has given you. That's wisdom. That's wisdom. He says, choose wisdom over power every time. Your strength will go away. Your wisdom will not. And so that's his fourth piece of advice. And then finally, number five, which is the culmination of not only this chapter, but the entire book, which shows you how unbelievably beautiful the book is put together. This is the conclusion for this chapter and for the book. Verse 29, there are three things that walk with stately stride, no four that strut about. Okay, so we're gonna talk about what? We're gonna talk about pride. We're gonna talk about strutting around, strutting your stuff, okay? So here it is. The lion, the king of animals who won't turn aside for anything. Well, why does a lion strut about? Because he's king of the jungle. Who's gonna take him out? Of course he can strut about. Number two, a strutting rooster. Well, the rooster is in the hen house. Rooster's the only male and he's got all these women. Man, he's on top of the world. He's strutting around like he owns the place because he does. Number three, the male goat. They used to use in these days male goats to lead and shepherd the sheep. So the male goat, he's, up, he's in a place of authority over the sheep. He's the guy, he's, he's the big man on campus. He's just like the lion and the rooster. All three of these in their area, what they have in common is they're strutting around because they are the king of the jungle. And so all three of them strut around because they have that kind of authority. And then here's the fourth one, and here's the final piece of wisdom. So, so, so smart. A king as he leads his army. Well, why does a king strut about? Well, because he's the big man on campus. He has all the authority, and he has a, a, a team of people around him that are willing to die for him. And so what does he do? He struts around because he can. Because there's going to be a whole lot of people die to make sure he's safe. And so he struts. Here's the final piece of wisdom. Don't be like that king. Don't be like that king. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own power, on your own strength, on your own wisdom, on your own smarts, on your own ingenuity, on, on your own body, on your own money. Don't, don't trust in anything else. Just trust in the Lord. Look at the next verse. If you have been a fool by being proud or plotting evil, cover your mouth in shame. See what he says? Don't trust in anything else. Do you remember the theme of the book of Proverbs 3, 5, and 6? That's the theme. We, we did a whole study on it. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and what? Lean not on your own understanding. That's the book of Proverbs. And we took that theme and we ran it through a whole lot of different things, a whole lot of topics. And now we end here at the end of Proverbs with the same thought. Here's Agur saying, look, I've got all this wisdom for you, but I want to wrap it up with just this. Exactly the way he started, don't trust in human wisdom. Don't think you have a lot of wisdom and strength and power just because you think you're the king. Don't trust in your money and your power and all that stuff. Who do you trust in? The Lord your God. The Lord your God. Because He's the one that holds all power, all strength, all might. That is God. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. That is the book of Proverbs. Let's pray. Father, thank you for our time together. On this video, Lord, I, I just pray that everyone that watches this, they're really struck by the wisdom of this chapter because there's so much in there, Lord, that can help us be the men and women you want us to be. And so I pray for that for them. Lord, thank you for this study out of the book of Proverbs. Help us to accept the fact that your wisdom is right and man's wisdom is wrong. Help us to submit to your wisdom and not to lean on our own. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, God bless you. Have a great week. If you do something for me, I'd love for you to go to my website, uh, embarkmen.com. Look around uh, because we have some uh, groups that you could actually participate in. I have Zoom attached to every group so you can actually get on there and participate in groups with us no matter where you live. 
around the country. So we'd love to have you do that. And then this is a ministry and, and we have administrative costs. So if this is feeding you, I would invite you also to go there and donate to the ministry so we can continue feeding people out of the Word of God. Thank you. God bless you.